Thank you very much, Tom. Very much appreciate the opportunity to address your good self and your good school today and uh, members of the audience. Uh, I do have a bit of a vanity shot, but uh, Tom has stolen my thunder. <laughs> uh, and so as I introduce myself, I'll just leave that up there for a moment. I can speak about Islamic finance for half an hour, one hour, one day, one week. Um, as I interpose that between uh, Asia-Pacific policy for Australia, which is a matter and a subject that I'm deeply committed to, uh, our relationship with the Arab world, and I'll take you through what I believe about that in terms of a go north, turn left strategy, and I'll take you through that in a moment. Don't look that up because I just made that up just then. And about Australia's position in the world and how we can, not only from a public policy perspective, but from a government and corporate perspective, take advantage of our position, our history, and our resources. And so my main mantra throughout the course of everything I speak about, whether it's as a frustrated academic, i.e. at ANU, whether it's as a government official at, as in the Council of Australia Arab Relations or the Australia Malaysia Institute, or as a business person, is about Team Australia and what we could do so much better. And in fact, uh, stop this reliance on uh, alternatively living off the back of the farmer or the miner in Australia, which char characterises Australian history. We've had a massive set of booms, and it's either a farming boom or an ag boom or a mining boom. We're told that the ag, uh, m latest mining boom is about to come off, and we're already also told that Australia could be the agricultural bowl of the world. I tend, I'd like to call it the hummus bowl of the world. And so with one pattern starts another. Now whilst I agree with the tectonic point that is being made, which is absolutely true historically, I believe Australia has a lot more to offer to Asia and to the world at large. And I won't go into a pro-nationalistic list of them, you kind of think I was an ambassador for Australia, but we all know them, education, technology, financial services, etc. And Islamic finance, which is an area that I uh, have uh, uh, played a role, is, could be one of those as well, especially when you look north, and there's 600 million Muslims living just north of us in a rising Asia, and there's a few other Muslims that you might have heard about in the Middle East. Um, that are all looking for services and potentially our know-how. So I speak in that context and in that belief structure. And, uh, and so I turn to, uh, Crescent, well, uh, sorry, to Islamic finance in Australia and a lot of the work that I've done as Managing Director of Crescent Wealth. Uh, and I was explaining to Martin uh, before that it's pretty hard to actually talk about an Islamic finance industry in Australia without talking about Crescent Wealth. One, because I'm the managing director of it. Two, because it's the only one here. So, and so uh, from here on, I'll omit to talk about that, and that's the reason, uh, because I don't want my academic career crossing over with my corporate career as much as possible. Uh, but that's, if you're wondering, and during the course of my uh, presentation as to why I don't mention Crescent Wealth, that's the reason in short. So, Islamic finance. First of all, what is it? And second of all, it's been the next biggest thing in Australia for 20 years. I've not heard a university, and just about every university, a large law firm, a large accounting firm, a large investment house say, oh yes, we've got a whole division of Islamic finance experts of some sort or another. Yes, we structured the D, Y, Z, X, whatever. And, and I say, Okay, so who are your clients? Because I'm the only client in the country. And so, once again, Australia, given that it's such a conservative country, even though on the outside it seems like we're so innovative in a lot of different things, any capital venture person will tell you we're not that innovative. Uh, we're innovative up to a point, but then we say it's too much risk for us. We keep looking at opportunities, and Islamic finance is one of them, and we say, oh, I don't know. 
I don't think we can make it happen for one reason or another. And so I can attest to you as a former director of PwC and a director of Babcock and Brown and investment house and law firm and accounting firm that we have spent millions, and I mean millions of dollars of man and women hours looking at Islamic finance. But nobody's taken uh, the first, second or third step uh, because they're missing one of the elements that's required to make it successful. And even though uh, 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 the global reports, you look around in, Islamic fi in terms of finance, it is the only sector in finance globally that's growing at double-digit figures. It is the only segment. And it's been growing for 10 years. And it went from 100 million to 1 billion to 1 trillion to 1.6 trillion. And so this is the context I speak about Islamic finance again today in terms of a preface, uh, preface about what I'm about to say. And so in Australia, we are going to play a major, major role. So what does, it, what does Islamic finance actually mean? What, when we say Sharia, which is a you know, code word for beheadings and oppression of women, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the broader populace, what does it actually mean? Well, Sharia means law, effectively. So I'm a common law lawyer. It means the common law, for want of a better word. And it basically has set principles of how you do business based on fairness, equity, and justice. And so there's a ban on usury, that good old Christian slash Jewish slash Muslim concept of unfair lending. There's a ban on uncertainty and, uncertainty and speculation. Gambling is prohibited. High risk, think GFC, is prohibited. Closing your eyes and flicking your money because you've got too much of it or too little of it so you're not educated enough to spend it is banned. You're not allowed to take advantage of people. The, 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 there's a ban on the financing of certain economic sectors, tobacco, alcohol, pornography, armaments, gambling, gaming. And there is a principle of sharing return and risk. And we'll go to that in a, in a bit more detail in a minute. And I'll try and break it down in terms of the 101 for the layman. And of course, there is a link, the final principle is there is a link between the activity and a real asset. In the modern conventional world, we call it recourse lending or recourse activity, where a bank has recourse to an asset. So when a bank lends you money, they say, we'll give you a million dollars, Mr. Professor Compass, and you give us, you know, you've got 100, we've got 900,000, but we want recourse. If you fail to pay, we will take that particular asset and we'll have a legal document called a mortgage where we take it and sell it and return our money. So let me principles say, well, that's not, that's not fair because I'm lending him $900,000 but with no risk to me. So I can pretend I actually care about the asset and I can pretend I actually care about whether he has an ability to pay. But I know in the back of my mind, you know, he may retire tomorrow. His circumstances might change. And if he doesn't pay me back, I'm going to take that house and sell it. Islamic lending and principles suggest something different. It says, well, have you actually looked at the asset? Is it actually worth a million dollars that he's paying for it? And so in terms of a sharing of profit and return, Islamically, I've got a JV with Professor Compass, and I've got to say, take the risk with him. So if he puts in 10%, I put in 90% as a bank, I own 90% of the home, Professor Compass owns 10%. And then he'll pay me rent for my 90%. But if he sells the house and he makes a capital profit, we share it. If he loses money, we share it. And then I care very much about him and his decision-making process and his assets because I am sharing risk and return. That layman's principle goes to what we call asset backing, asset-based or asset-backed uh, uh, financing, which is a lot more complicated for my lecture here today. But the principle is you've always got to be able to trace uh, your activity back to something real as opposed to made up. For those economists in the room, if you think of, remember we started with money, it started at M1, and now we've gone to M7, where we define what money is. We started money was, we started bartering, then gold was a medium of exchange, and then we kept redefining and redefining, redefining money to M7 where money meant 
an instrumentality that was traded, not based on any gold or anything uh, practical. Well, Islamic investment does not accept that. We're still back at M2 or M3, where the medium of exchange is based on something valuable. And it has to make sense. If the Western world accepted the concept, there would be no GFC. There would be no securitization of assets. And then you package something up that was never really there in the first place. Then you sell it to somebody else who's equally as greedy as you and, and vice versa and vice versa, and then it blows up. So that gives you a very quick, that's like covering the common law in five minutes. It's covering the whole Islamic gambit of Islamic generalized principles of finance. But in very specific investment uh, uh, procedure, and what my firm does, and what is a global standard, there's a global body called IOFI, which is based in Bahrain, and it is 90% default standard of the world. It's like the IFRS accounting standards. So when we invest in Australia on behalf of Australian Muslims and ultra-ethical investors, there's actually two filters that you go through. The first filter is a qualitative filter, and the second filter is a quantitative filter. So I've just described to you the high-end principles, and then you've actually got a set of rules that define those investments. And so if you invest Islamically, you cannot invest in financial services which give, which give or take usury, debt. So Quarry Bank, CBA, NAB, etc., are not investable in terms of our funds or any Islamic fund. In the companies that sells tobacco, alcohol, uh, adult material, gambling, morally hazardous media, pork or weapons or armaments. So that's a qualitative filter. So on the stock exchange, think about it, we remove all those companies where their main activity is involved in this area. But that's the first filter, and that's what a lot of people know about. But that's where their knowledge stops. Islamic finance and Islamic investment is actually value investing, which is quite conservative. It's value investing, which is quite conservative. Because the global rules then have a quantitative filter, a numbers filter for us numbers heads. And so you can have a company that doesn't do any of those things, then we put it through a second filter. Does it have any gearing, borrowing, any kind of borrowing of more than 30%? That's pretty conservative. So if a company is trading, its revenue is $10 million, and it has a $3 million loan of any sort, then if it's more than $3 million, then we do not invest in it, because we think that is higher risk profile than Islamically acceptable. Um, if it holds, by way of policy, more than 30% liquid cash on its balance sheet. So that means if it's got 30% sitting in the bank uh, of various forms in cash, because it's either a hoarder or, alternatively, a vulture fund. And, you know, for someone who worked at one of those funds for many years, that's exactly what we did. If it has more than 70% accounts receivable, what does that mean? That's the Islamic version that's 1,400 years old of the insolvency test. If you've issued a million dollars worth of invoices to be paid, and after a year you haven't collected $700,000, you've got a major problem. And the last one is a materiality test. The accountants in the room would be familiar with that. Materiality test is, well, you know, you're in Australia, you're BHP, what you're doing fits into the qualitative filter, but then you, you've come into some cash and you've You've, you've arbitraged term deposits. You've put money in term deposits and played with it to get a return on the shareholder's money. If it's less than 5%, so 3%, then those profits derived from the prohibited activity are then cleansed, removed by us, and given to an Australian registered charity. If it's more than 5% emanating from a prohibited activity, then after a period of time, we actually sell the company down because it's material. Their prohibited activity is ma now material, which is a classic accounting standard. Those are the rules that we apply. Those are the filters that 90% of the world's Islamic investment fund managers apply. And so this gives you context. If you do remove the word Islamic and just put ultra-ethical, then most people can relate to what we're doing because if you're in a superannuation or you're an investor, everybody's invested in Australia who works now through superannuation. What do you want? Stable returns that are value, that don't do the wrong thing but give you a good return 
over a long period of time. So the way I describe Islamic finance investment is low risk, medium return. Low risk, medium return. Guess what? That's the Australian superannuation system, supposedly. Supposedly. And because we're investing people's retirement funds. But all Islamic investments are like that. Or they're supposed to be like that. So I've given you a picture of the generalised Islamic principles and the specific standards which are accessible on the net by anybody who cares to, to, to want to understand what are the actual filters we apply to Islamic investment. So we talk about switching now to the Australian Muslim community because we are obviously in Australia and talking about the global horizon but there's a thriving Muslim community in Australia. You can see that there's a 40% growth rate on average um, with the census figures. So up there, we've got the Australian census figures. But I actually don't agree with the Australian census figures because you know, we live in this thing called a democracy. So in a democracy, which I'm very proud of, you don't have to tell them what your religion is. So I, for one, don't tick the Muslim box and never have. And I, I believe majority of Muslims do not. And we have that right to do that in Australia. And we should cherish that right. Every Australian should cherish that right. Um, but that, we have the administrative issue of not being properly represented in the census. I believe, and we believe, that that figure is more like one million. It's at least double. And the reason we know that is, anecdotally, we attend the mosques and the, and the societies and on Eids and you know, the celebrations. And we know there's a lot more than 476,000 Muslims in this country. So the Australian Muslim population is not only increasing in number and size and influence, reading the Australian Financial Review today is evidence of that and the Sydney Morning Herald, etc., in terms of the role they play on a national stage, but including the needs and requirements for choice, including in investments and to play a broader role in Australia. But they are also a critical differentiator and advantage in terms of Australia's foreign policy, economic policy, cultural policy, and as we rise, as the Asian century rises, we can rise with it. And I'll elaborate more about that. And Australian Muslims should be seen as that bridge. At the moment, we Australian Muslims are seen through the context of a human rights prism and agenda. And I actually don't agree with that whatsoever. Where are the Australian Muslims living? 97% of them are under 65. 50% of them are 25 to 44, which is very young for the Australian context. And 78% live in Sydney and Melbourne, of which that 78%, 70% live in Sydney. So you can see they live in major concentrations. There's about 10 in Canberra. They're all here. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> There's actually a significant proportion of Muslims who live in Canberra. But Canberra having only 300,000 people and being a government city um, doesn't have the same concentration. But there is a significant uh, community or set of communities in Canberra. And as I said, the Australian Muslim community has financial needs like everyone else. Home, car, health, super, investment and insurance. And linking back to my first statement, everybody's been talking about it for 20 years. Whilst there are financial institutions endeavouring to establish, to set up, to provide. There's no institution that has actually succeeded in doing anything on a national scale, which has become a trusted brand name, which is what myself and others are looking to do because we have such a wonderful opportunity. Let me give you an example, and I mentioned my own firm to start with, but this is uh, something that's pretty surprising that I mentioned at the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue. And it's an interesting fact that most people aren't aware of. Most people believe that Islamic finance is emanating out of the Middle East or Malaysia. So the two hubs in the world, Malaysia and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, Islamic finance is very big and very important and a key to the economy, etc. Well, it burst my bubble a few years ago when I went looking for some help about how I can establish an Islamic finance company in Australia. And surely there must be someone to copy. Surely there must be someone to lead. Surely there must be some, something, because I'm a common law lawyer, I'm not a Sharia scholar, I, you know, trained to get too many degrees from Australia. Never trained one day in any Arab or Islamic country 
or any, in, any, in any Arabic language for that matter. And the reality is, Islamic finance was bigger in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, in terms of scope and nature compared to Australia because we're tiny, and in Malaysia. It's still a tiny proportion of banking in the Arab and Islamic world and in the, and the Asian world. Conventional banking is the main banking. In Saudi Arabia, 80 to 90% are conventional banks. and The other one's private and Islamic. So there's this notion that Islamic banking is coming from the Western world here, and we're taking Western banking to the Islamic world. No, no. Conventional banking dominates the world. Islamic banking is new in the Islamic world. Bigger, but it's still new. Most people in Malaysia, most people in Indonesia, most people in Egypt, most people in Saudi Arabia bank with HSBC or Baraka Bank or whatever. Now, that's an interesting fact. But a, a more interesting fact is that the world's first Sharia-compliant pension fund was born right here in Australia, called Crescent Wealth, APRA-regulated. The world's best-performing Islamic fund manager in accordance with IOFU principles that I just spoke to is a company called Satuna Capital on the west coast of the United States of America. So I stand up at the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue. How close is that to Islamic world and the Arabic world? Not. And I say, well, Islamic, the, 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 the best performing fund manager in the world and the first Sharia compliant pension fund is in America and Australia. And that's a very interesting fact as a business opportunity. If they, being those countries, do not take advantage of such a great ultra-ethical principles, then we could possibly lead the way. Give you an example about mortgages. There's a couple of organisations writing Islamic mortgages. To give you a little bit of a taste, in the last 20 years, $700 million of Islamic or Islamic-like mortgages have been written. My guess is that in the market, it should be $7 billion as a no-brainer. And if you looked at the whole Muslim community, and all, most of them have got mortgages, it's more like $700 billion. But we just quoted the actual figure. If you think about everybody owns a, you know, there's 200,000 people that own a home and they on average borrow $500,000 from the majors, just like everybody else. Property is very expensive in Australia. You can do the numbers. There are very few Islamic institutions. NAB is having a big go with my friend Imran Lam in terms of the capital markets, uh, which is issuing an Islamic bond or sukuk through Malaysia and I think Indonesia. Um, having enormous problems with APRA uh, because they just don't get it. And whilst I have the highest regard for our prudential authorities, um, and we are, uh, and we compete with Canada, but I would say we're the most sophisticated, robust, resilient banking system in the world. Um, and APRA does a wonderful job. Uh, but at the same time, the cost of that is conservatism. Not just Islamic banking, anything new. Um, and uh, hope. Uh, that NAB is able to agree with APRA about issuing of a bond, where Australia will issue its own bond through the normal markets. Um, ANZ is not doing very much. It owns 25% of AmBank, Arab Malaysian Bank, which owns an Islamic bank, but it's kind of just an owner. Um, and at the, and the, uh, at the other end, we've got a lot of sovereign funds floating around the world looking to do something generally con conventional, not necessarily Islamic. Now, uh, switching slightly to what does it mean to invest Islamically when you apply it through the filters. So you say, how are people invested now? And how does that compare, comply with Islamic principles? Well, I've got some nutrition facts for you. Everybody understand nutrition facts? All of us on diets, right? Maybe not. So most Australian superannuation, which is 1.6 trillion, as of today, tomorrow probably 1.6, 1.7 trillion actually. It's growing so phenomenally. A lot of the um, investments, up to 40%, are in uh, non-ultra-ethical investment. So it's either in cash, fixed income, n Australian and international. Australian shares, you might, you might wonder why we've listed Australian shares. Well, Australian at the top ASX 200 or 300, pick one the top 200, biggest 200, 300 companies, uh, a third of banks, so a third are out. 
And then, you know, important companies like Woolworths. Now, people are upset with Woolworths for many reasons. But let me tell you something about Woolies, our grocery chain. So we do not invest in Woolworths because it is the largest seller of alcohol in this country. And most people kind of have understand that. But they don't also realise that it's owner of many assets. And it's actually the largest owner of gaming and gambling assets in this country by a country mile. So if you picked up the, the, all the assets of the seven largest casinos in Las Vegas, their gaming assets, put them together, that's how many, that's how many assets Woolworths has. Most Australians from an Islamic background or not simply don't have that information. And then we've got all the various other assets, including international shares, which invest in banks, etc. So if you're of a view to invest ultra-ethically, then this is where your money is invested now. Uh, most people, including myself up until very recently, can't read an asset allocation strategy um, in an annual report that's 30 pages long and boring as you can get. And, you know, not unless I was really, really interested, I wouldn't even read my own. But, and that's most Australians. So in the regulatory regime that we do have, where our money is being invested is a long way away from where we believe it's invested. That's if we actually have a look. Um, we believe that even though the census figures are 2.1% of the population, they're more like 4%. But even on those figures by 2020, there is conservatively an average of $22 billion mar Islamic investment market living inside mortgages. Because there's no institution that sells Islamic mortgages today. There, there are organisations, but there are no institutions that do it on a low scale, on a small scale. Let me give you an example of some other countries which we, we traditionally look to. Uh, one you may have heard of, it's called the UK. Um, it's got 22 banks offering Islamic finance. And the UK have opened up their doors They've got a 3 to 3.5 million Muslims uh, living in the, in, in the UK, and they're 4.8% of the population. I believe we've got a similar proportion, but we're, in Australia, more integrated. But with 22 banks offering all kinds of products, we don't have not one bank. There's not one bank offering any kind of Islamic product in this country. And for me, that goes to the story about why aren't we taking advantage of opportunities? Why do we seem to think that we're going to live forever off the back of the miners or the farmers? This is opportunity looking us in the face and one I have clearly identified and I'm working with, but there are many others. And why, if, I, if you agree with the fact that I said in Indonesia, Islamic banking is present, but it's not widespread. Why can we build the product that is trusted, that is solid, because our banks are very trusted and very solid? and go to Indonesia and do that, as ANZ moves into Indonesia, as NAB is now moving into the Australian Financial Review today about expansion into Asia. Um, some of our partners, uh, in terms of what we're doing in Australia, and that's partnered with the only Australian firm, is Bank of London in the Middle East, one of the banks that I refer to. Now, they have a billion pound, collected a billion pounds over three years, and are the largest Islamic bank in Europe. Another partner is HSBC Amana, which is the largest bank in the world. And they have been extremely successful linking in the Middle East and the UK. And I'd like to think Australia follows in those footsteps and builds those bridges and those links and takes an ultra-ethical principle and sells it back to the Middle East. Another partner is Satuna Capital, the firm I just referred to, you, uh, referred you to, in terms of being the world's best Islamic fund manager. Morningstar rated five, and for an investment manager in the US for a product, that is the best rating you can get in terms of profitability, success, safety. They've made a profit for 20 years straight. And two important facts. They've got 3.7 million US dollars under management. They also are 90% invested from the broader American community. So it's not the Muslim American community that's got 3.7 billion. 
It's the likes of JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and HSBC investing their client money because of the return and the value add. And even more importantly and interestingly, the founder is a guy called Nick Kaiser, who is uh, a Texan Republican and has done an amazing job. Conservative guy, great investor, not of the Islamic faith or background, and lectures the world in Islamic finance. He runs the best Islamic finance investment organization there is in the world, without a shadow of a doubt, and the biggest fund, from a small town in Washington State called Bellingham, which I visited personally. And that is an amazing opportunity from the west coast of the United States of America. Uh, and so it's 90% in the US. In Malaysia, it's 60% of all Islamic investment is from the non-Muslim community. Now this, I'm trying to wrap up a little bit here by saying the go north, turn left strategy. So when I add in my comments at the start and what you've learned about Islamic finance, there's no reason why in Australia we have 600 million Muslims living there. We have about 250 million Muslims, and I count China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, various parts of the Philippines. And there is no dominant Islamic product in those countries. In fact, they don't even talk to each other on these Islamic finance issues uh, because there's cross-jurisdictional cross issues, which the Western conventional banking has solved quite dramatically. That's why you have HSBC and Citibank and Bank Mellon, etc because they've, they've worked out those cross-jurisdictional issues. But we can be a hub, not only in Islamic finance, but in all things as the Asian century, as the Asian, as the Asian nations rise in this century, as the only Western democratic uh, first world country to help all our brothers and sisters in the region through education, medical services, geography, whatever you, whatever you so please, feed into as a trusted, uh, uh, as a trusted nation, as a neighbour, feed into the Asian <coughs> nations as they look for more resources and know-how, and then go to the Middle East as our next port of call. But the Middle East has got plenty of cash, especially Gulf states, that they're looking to invest because Europe is no longer a good investment, and they're not welcome in the US. And then we end up with that famous American word, triangulate. We go north, turn left, and come back again. That is a virtuous, not circle, triangle that I'm looking to create and to try and sell. And that's why I'm saying the go north, turn left strategy is in all elements of what I do for a business, what I do for government, and what I believe strongly is in, in, is in the interest of Australia, and we must take note. Snapshot, 1.8 trillion was 1.6 trillion a year ago. 200 uh, billion Islamic finance has increased. Globally, I'll give you some more figures. You can get, get these off the web at any particular time you wish. <coughs> That's about pension funds. Crescent Wealth being the world's first pension fund, Islamic compliant pension fund, just goes to show that the world's Muslims are just under one quarter of the world's population but less than 1% have pension funds. They constitute less, and we round it up dramatically. You know, when you round up, the rule is if you're 0.5 and below, you go to zero. Well, we weren't going to go zero. So we round it up quite dramatically. It's less, it's probably 0.001% of people in the Islamic world who actually have a pension. One matter linking back to Australia. There is a multitude of Islamic banking or Islamic uh, investment funds floating around the world looking for infrastructure opportunities. They have not yet discovered Australia. We need to help them. There's $770 billion that we failed to have, to have unlocked from the superannuation system. Anybody in superannuation who knows about superannuation, knows about our infrastructure, says, hang on, it's a match. We've got trillions <coughs> here, and we've got nearly a trillion, or three quarters of a trillion, of assets that need funding. But there's a liquidity issue, which means that if super, superannuation funds need to be able to sell their asset that they own or have a very small proportion that's unsellable. And so unless we solve that, which we're not going to solve anytime soon, then 
you know, it's, we're going to have a, a gap. And unless we put up, can, can continue to put up taxes, we're not going to solve that problem. I say, look towards Islamic funds. All the large Kuwaiti, Gulf, Egyptian, all the large, they're all sitting on large cash assets looking to invest. We're not even on the radar screen yet. And, and then, I guess, you know, there's a lot of little things that we're trying to do on a state and federal level. Nothing that I could proudly say to you that's worked, likely to work in the near future, or even actually put us on the radar screen. Probably my next lecture will be about how we do that in the Arab world and the Asian world. Thank you very much.